Yeah, it should be my slides now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, thanks so much to the museum for hosting this event. Just really excited to be here to tell you about two of my favorite things, linguistics and crosswords. And thank you all for signing on. Um, really enjoyed seeing everyone in the chat before this talk saying where they're uh, signing on from. As a speaker of a language, you know much more about that language than you probably realize. I'm going to give a couple examples of this fact from English, since that's the language this talk is in, but the same basic fact is true of any other language you might speak as well. A first example is the sound made by the letters TH. If you know how to speak English, you know how to pronounce this pair of letters. The thing you might not have realized before is that there are actually two distinct sounds that typically get spelled with TH. Uh, to see these two sounds, you can compare certain pairs of words that differ from each other only in terms of which version of TH they have. For instance, we have the plant thistle versus the contraction thistle, thistle, thistle. And there's also the part of your leg, the thigh, versus the Shakespearean pronoun thy, thy, thy. Another aspect of your language that you know on some level but might not have consciously realized before relates to the prefix re. This prefix can modify verbs in English to show that the action of the verb is repeated. For instance, the door reopened means the door opened again, and the magician reappeared means the magician appeared again. Uh, the part about this that you might not have noticed before is that it only works for certain verbs. There are other verbs that you cannot use this prefix with. So my cousin re-sneezed is ungrammatical, and so is the manager re-left. And something that makes this especially surprising is that it's pretty clear what these words should mean if they were allowed. It would mean my cousin sneezed again or the manager laughed again. But even though the intended meaning of these words is clear, they're still ungrammatical. And both of these examples have something in common. In both cases, you must be aware of the facts I just told you on some level in order to speak the language. So you have to know which version of TH to use in order to correctly say thistle instead of thistle. And you also need to know which verbs can and cannot take the prefix re so that you avoid um, saying re sneezed or re left. But even though you know these things on some unconscious level, most people never consciously realize them. You could go your entire life as a fluent English speaker without ever noticing these facts. And this is where linguists come in. One of the main goals of linguistics is to analyze and characterize these easy to miss aspects of language to figure out what rules govern the way we speak. Um, and I'll mention at this point that there are two common definitions of the word linguist. One is someone who speaks many languages, uh, but the definition I'll mainly be using throughout this talk is someone who um, analyzes the structure and the usage of language. Uh, of course, there's often a lot of overlap between both types of linguists. This gets us into half of this presentation's topic, the linguistic side, but what about crossword puzzles? Well, when you open up a crossword puzzle, you become a linguist for 10 minutes, or maybe for 10 hours, depending on how tricky the crossword puzzle is. That is, in order to solve a crossword puzzle, it's not enough to simply use language in the automatic, unconscious way you normally do. Instead, you need to analyze the language. You need to break down the language into its parts and then put those parts back together, just like linguists do. So this is the connection I'll be building on throughout this talk. And to give a little bit more detail about how this talk's going to work, I'll first talk about the linguistics of the clues and then the linguistics of the answer grid. And each of those will take about 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, then we'll take a five minute stretch break since this is a pretty long time slot to be sitting in a Zoom meeting. And then I'll close by discussing the more human side of language. And then the rest of the time will be for questions and discussion. So let's start out with the linguistics of crossword clues. The topic I'll be focusing on here is ambiguity. Language is absolutely teeming with ambiguity. Pretty much every sentence you've ever heard or uttered is likely to be ambiguous in some way. But most of the time, we simply don't notice this ambiguity. To give an example of a common type of sentence that's ambiguous without us usually noticing it, suppose you've told a friend, I'm going to go visit Boston next week. Your friend might then ask you, how long will you be in Boston? And this question is ambiguous. If you interpret it in the normal way, the answer that you would give is something like, I'll be in Boston for about a week. But there is another way you could interpret this question where your answer would be something like, I'll be the same length in Boston that I am everywhere else, about five foot 11. And of course, this is a totally ridiculous way to interpret this question. So normally if someone asks you, how long will you be in Boston? You don't even consider the second interpretation. 
you just automatically rule out the ambiguity and treat it as an unambiguous question, which leads to response one. And the reason that you can rule this out is that we have all sorts of common sense and life experience that teaches us that people never ask how long a person is, they say how tall you are. But um, even though we normally are able to filter out this ambiguity automatically, what crossword clues do is they force you to recognize the ambiguity that normally goes unnoticed. So here's one example of a classic crossword clue. The clue is way to go. And I'm sure you've encountered this expression many times. It just means congratulations. And normally when you hear this phrase, you don't have to think too much about how the words get put together to create the raw meaning of the expression. But to answer this clue correctly, you have to think about it a little more. You have to realize that the word way could mean a path. So that way to go means a path that you could travel on. So the answer to this clue is route. Um, and for the rest of this part of the talk, I'm going to walk through giving a sort of taxonomy of all the different types of ambiguity that crossword puzzles will use in crossword clues and uh, what these different types of ambiguity show us about language. Uh, and just to note about these clues, as you can see in the bottom left of this slide, for all the clues I'm gonna show, I've done my best to find the earliest usage of that clue in a crossword puzzle, and then to include a citation to both the constructor and the editor of that puzzle, because usually in a crossword puzzle, uh, some of the clues are by the constructor and some are by the editor. So you never really know which one um, is, deserves the credit or the blame for the tricky clues. A first type of ambiguity that shows up often in crossword clues is ambiguity that's only ambiguous in the way it's pronounced. An example of this is the clue movie night. Now, if you say this out loud, it sounds exactly like the common phrase movie night, where night does not have a K on it. Um, but from looking at the spelling, you can tell it's not that type of movie night. Instead, it's saying a knight, as in a knight in shining armor, um, from a movie. So the answer to this clue is Jedi, because the Jedi knights are knights in the Star Wars movies. Another example of this type of ambiguity is the clue Whole Foods, which sounds the same as the grocery store Whole Foods, but is spelled differently. So here this clue means foods with holes in them, namely donuts. And uh, for both of these clues, they're not especially tricky because the spelling gives away the fact that some shenanigans are going on. But they still have that effect I mentioned of making you realize that something which you never realized was ambiguous actually is. For example, now you might realize that when you hear someone mention Whole Foods, it could mean um, the name of the grocery store, which is meant to convey a very healthy lifestyle, but it also could be interpreted to mean a type of food that um, is not so conducive to a healthy lifestyle. A second type of ambiguity you'll see very often is ambiguity that works both with the pronunciation and the spelling. To illustrate this type of ambiguity, I've put here five different clues that all lead to the same four letter answer. The clues are winter coat, bank deposit, wet blanket, cold shower, and frosted flakes. And the answer that all five of these clues go to is snow. So each of these clues has some different ambiguity in it. In winter coat, coat is the ambiguous word. Um, you have to interpret it as something that coats the ground instead of a winter coat. In bank deposit, the question is, is it a snow bank versus a financial bank? Wet blanket is similar to winter coat. It's not a blanket that goes on a bed. It's something that blankets the ground. In cold shower, you have to interpret it as snow shower instead of a shower with shampoo. And then in frosted flakes, it's snowflakes rather than cornflakes and frosted with ice rather than frosted with sugar. Now, all the clues I've shown so far are pretty tricky to start with, but sometimes crossword constructors will work even harder to make the clues tricky by exploiting a psycholinguistic phenomenon called priming. Um, to show you what priming is, I'm going to introduce the experimental paradigm that psycholinguists have used to establish that priming is a thing. The way these experiments work is that you'll be shown a screen with words on it, one word at a time. And as each word appears, you have to push a button to indicate whether the word is a real word or a made up word. And the experimenters will measure how long it takes you to recognize whether each word is real or fake. For instance, you might see horse, real word, blick, fake word, churn, fake word, doctor, real word. And then another participant in the experiment might see a slightly different set of words. They might see nurse, real word, blick, fake word, churn, fake word, doctor, real word. So to re recap, these are the two different sequences of words that the two different participants saw. The first person saw horse, blick, churn, doctor, and the second person saw nurse, blick, churn, doctor. And 
what the experimenters have noticed is that if you look at how long it takes the participants to recognize the word doctor, the people in the second condition will recognize doctor faster than people in the first condition. And the reason is that in the second condition, it started out with the word nurse. And seeing that word primes you to expect other related words in the future, that is other medical related words. And then when you see doctor a few words later, it doesn't surprise you as much. Um, it doesn't take you as long to recognize because you've been expecting it. If the last word in the sequence had instead been pony, then the people in the first condition would have recognized it faster because in their case, the word horse would have primed them to expect other horse related words. So how is priming manipulated in crossword clues? Uh, here's one example. The clue is earthling who grew up near Venus. And um, even without any special sort of priming, I expect that the first association you have with the word Venus is probably the planet. And then here in this clue, the word earthling adds in some priming that further strengthens that association. So when you start reading the clue, you see the word earthling, which makes you expect other words related to science fiction or astronomy. Um, and then after being primed in th that way, once you see Venus, now without even a second's hesitation, you'll interpret the word Venus as being the planet. But all of that is a misdirection. In order to answer this clue correctly, you instead have to interpret Venus as the tennis player, Serena Will or Venus Williams. And so the answer, which I just gave away, was her sister, Serena, who is indeed an earthling and who, of course, grew up near Venus. Another example of priming um, is this clue. Many of the world's rulers use it. So the word ruler is ambiguous. And unlike Venus, I think it's, both of its interpretations are roughly equally common in our language. The two interpretations are the measuring stick ruler versus the leader ruler. Um, but in this clue, the fact that there's the word world early on in it will prime you to expect other words that like world are related to geopolitics. So then when you come to the word ruler after it, you're more likely to interpret ruler to mean leader rather than measuring stick. But again, that's a misdirection. To get the right answer, you have to interpret ruler as meaning the measuring stick to give you the answer metric system. Now, all the examples of ambiguity that I've shown you so far are in some sense arbitrary. That is, there's no special reason why the meaning measuring stick and the meaning leader have um, the same pronunciation in English. You could easily imagine English having evolved in a different way where those two meanings were not pronounced in the same way. But there are other types of ambiguity that, are, that do have a stronger reason behind them. And we can call those systematic ambiguity. One example of this is with words that refer to types of organizations or companies, where any word like this, such as bank, is ambiguous between meaning the abstract organization versus meaning the concrete um, building that hosts the organization. So in the first sentence here, the bank is made of white marble. Um, in that case, bank means the physical building because it's talking about the construction material. But in the second sentence, the bank employs 400 people now it's talking about the organization, not the building, because buildings don't employ people. And in fact, in today's world, you could easily have a bank that's online only without having a building, but still employing people. And the reason this is systematic is that it works for any word that indicates an organization or company. So you could also say the library is made of white marble versus the library employs 400 people. Or the gas station is made of white marble. The gas station employs 400 people. It would just be a very a large and fancy gas station. Now, this specific type of systematic ambiguity um, is not particularly relevant in crossword puzzles, but there's another type of systematic ambiguity that crossword constructors absolutely love to use. So to illustrate that type of ambiguity, I've shown here three clues, which all give the same answer. The clues are chemical agent for climate change, tops for pots, and ancients, for instance. And the answer that all three of these have in common is anagram. Uh, that is, chemical agent is an anagram of climate change. If you rearrange the letters in chemical agent, you get the phrase climate change. So the type of ambiguity that's being exploited here is that every word in English um, has its normal standard meaning, but in addition, you can also interpret it as referring to the word itself, the linguistic unit. For instance, the word dog um, does not just mean the furry animal, it can also mean the word dog in a sentence like, dog is three letters long. The furry animal is not three letters long. It's only the word that is three letters long. And these are some especially tricky crossword clues because we're definitely pretty strongly biased to uh, first interpret a word in its standard way. When you first read tops for pots, you'll definitely interpret these words as referring to entities in the world. 
And it takes quite a mental leap to realize that they're actually referring to the linguistic units rather than entities in the world. So far, all the ambiguities we've discussed have been ones where there's some single linguistic unit, a single word, which has multiple possible meanings. But there's another even deeper type of ambiguity we sometimes see where the ambiguity is instead identifying what the relevant linguistic units are in the clue. To give an example of this, one classic crossword clue is decrease, cluing this four letter answer. And normally when we encounter the word decrease, we interpret it as just being a single unit that you can't break down at all. But to answer this clue correctly, you instead have to realize that decrease could also be interpreted as having two parts to it, namely a prefix and a stem. Um, and I'm calling this morphological ambiguity because in linguistics, such word parts are called morphemes. Um, so here we have the prefix D and the stem crease, decrease. So if you break the word down in that way, you then interpret it as meaning to remove creases from, giving the answer iron, as into iron clothes. Another example of such morphological ambiguity is in the clue numerical value for a letter. So when you first read this clue, um, you'll probably interpret it as being some sort of secret code where you say replace each letter with a number. But that's the wrong interpretation here. The correct interpretation requires you to look more closely at the word letter. So just like before, normally letter is just a single unit, a single morpheme that cannot be broken down. Um, but in the context of this clue, it actually has two parts. It has the word stem let plus the suffix er, which has to be interpreted as someone who lets in the sense of letting out an apartment. Um, so a letter would be a landlord say, and then a numerical value for a landlord is rent. So in that morphological ambiguity, the ambiguity was about um, what the relevant units are in the clue you're reading. The final type of ambiguity I'll discuss is syntactic ambiguity, where now the ambiguity is about how the units, the linguistic units in the clue get put together to make a larger phrase. Uh, one example of this is in the clue seeing things. There are two different ways that you could parse the sequence of words. First, uh, the most natural way to interpret it is to say that seeing is a verb and things is a noun, and then you combine them together to get a verb phrase where uh, seeing is the main word in the phrase, the head of the phrase, and then a things is its direct object to mean something like hallucinate. But there is another way you could parse it. You could read it as both of these words being nouns. In this case, seeing as a noun, or in other words, a gerund, um, refers to the action of seeing. Then when you put them together, it creates a larger noun phrase, a noun noun compound where now the head of the phrase, the main word of the phrase is the word things. So overall, this gives us a plural noun phrase. And to answer the clue correctly, you have to use this second parse for the phrase. That is, you have to interpret the clue as meaning things involved with seeing, namely eyes. And uh, one more example of syntactic ambiguity, an especially tricky clue, is one of them does. When you first read this clue, I think the most natural way to parse it is to treat one of them as a single phrase, a single coherent unit. But to get the correct answer, you actually have to bracket it differently. You have to treat them does as a single unit, which at first seems nonsensical um, because that doesn't seem like a proper phrase. So to interpret it as a proper phrase, you also have to reinterpret both of these words. First, you have to realize that them in this context is not the um, normal pronoun. Instead, it's the colloquial um, version of the word those, as in when someone says there's gold in them hills, that means there's gold in those hills. And second, this is not the verb does, it's the noun does, as in female deer. Um, so really this does not say one of them does, it's saying one of those does to give the answer deer. Uh, now for all of these different examples of ambiguity, in order to get the right answer, you had to break down the, word, the structure of the clue, um, figure out what all the individual units in the clue meant, and then put them back together to get the intended interpretation of the clue. These actions that the clues force you to do highlight one of the most important properties of language, a property called compositionality, which is a property where you have a finite number of basic parts and then some rules for putting those parts together. And this is a pretty simple formula, but it underlies all the different levels of language and it also is incredibly powerful despite its simplicity. One reason it's so powerful is that it gives language the ability to, to create infinitely many um, complex structures and complex meanings just by putting together simple parts. 
So as one illustration of this sort of infinite power, um, it's an example I heard through uh, Ryan Bennett, which is to illustrate how the English language has infinitely many words in it. To demonstrate this, we start out with the word industry. Then we can add the suffix al to make um, an adjective industrial, which means relating to industry. Then we can add the suffix eyes to make a verb industrialize, which means to make something industrial. Then we can add the suffix ation to cre create industrialization, which means the process of industrializing. But now here's where the magical part happens. You'll notice that we started with the noun industry and now we're back at another noun indus industrialization. So we can just repeat the process. We can add the suffix al to create an adjective industrializational, which means relating to industrialization. Then we can add the suffix eyes to create a verb industrializationalize, which means to make something industrializational. And you can keep repeating this process ad infinitum and probably also ad nauseum to create increasingly ridiculous words like industrializationalizationalize with no principled upper limit on how long this can go. And of course, the longer and longer these words get, the less likely it is that you would ever have a scenario um, where you would need to use one of these words. But the point is that if you ever did encounter such a scenario, you would have exactly the tools you need to create a word to describe that scenario. And as a side note, um, I can verify that at least one of these words has been used at least once in a real context, because there's a book listed on Amazon, it's sold out unfortunately, but it is listed there, called Industrializational Impact on Urban Form and Environment. So on at least one occasion, a real person, not a linguist, has used this word industrializational. Uh, now for the veteran crossword solvers in the crowd, this process of uh, sticking on all these suffixes might remind you of certain types of answers that you occasionally see in crossword puzzles. Um, certain answers that involve a rather contrived usage of prefixes and suffixes. One type of these contrived answers that you'll often see in crosswords is a random verb plus the suffix er. So uh, one word that's shown up in crossword puzzles is reverer, which would mean one who reveres, a clue as devoted apostle, or referrer, meaning one who refers, or reciter, meaning one who recites. Another type of contrived answer you'll see um, that people get especially annoyed with is plural proper names. We have some random proper name that we usually associate with only one person that gets pluralized, as in Ashton's, actor Kutcher, and others, that is multiple people named Ashton, or Ono's, Yoko, and family, or Eris's, goddess of discord, at all. And you can definitely understand why crossword solvers get annoyed by these answers, because th there's really never a time when you need to refer to multiple heiresses. There's just the one goddess of discord. That's it. Um, nevertheless, though, um, these answers still do illustrate this um, powerful mechanism of language for creating new words. So even though you've never encountered a scenario where you need to talk about multiple heiresses, our language gives us the tool to talk about such a scenario if it should arise. So the next time you encounter one of these sorts of contrived answers in a crossword, instead of getting annoyed by it, maybe take it as a chance to uh, reflect on the incredible power that language gives us to create and understand infinitely many words that we've never encountered before. Okay, so that ends my discussion of the uh, crossword clues. And now I'm going to talk about the grid, the uh, other major part of a crossword puzzle. In discussing the clues, the main thing I focused on was the power of compositionality. But another important um, aspect of compositionality is that there are also usually some constraints on it. So remember, compositionality was this property of having um, a finite number of parts that you can put together in infinite ways. But usually this process of composing things together does have some constraints on it. You cannot just put things together willy-nilly. Uh, this fact was driven home to me early in my crossword career when I submitted a crossword puzzle that included the answer CIC, clued as Roman numeral for 199. And this crossword puzzle was rejected, mainly because it was pretty boring. Um, but in the rejection email, the editors also gently informed me that CIC is not a valid Roman numeral. The correct Roman numeral for 199 is CXCIX. So I had, um, uh, um, without knowing it, I had violated the rules that govern how you can put Roman numerals together. And this example is not especially linguistic, 
But there are plenty of examples from language uh, about similar constraints on how you can compose linguistic units together. We've actually seen one of these examples early in the talk with the prefix re, where we saw that a re can only apply to certain verbs. You can say reopened or reappeared, but not re-sneezed or re-left. Since we're now discussing the crossword grid, the important types of units to think about will instead be how sounds get combined together to form words, or more specifically, how letters get combined together to form words. Since in the crossword grid, the basic units are letters. And there are indeed all sorts of constraints on how letters can get put together or how sounds can get put together. There are some strict rules that have no exceptions. For instance, in English, no words end with the H sound. Now, there are some words that end with the letter H, but it's never pronounced as the H sound. It's either silent, as in pharaoh and chutzpah, or it's part of a different sound, such as in goulash or autograph. Uh, this rule here is very strict, it has no exceptions, but there are also some very strong statistical tendencies that although, although they are strong, they do have a few exceptions. For instance, very few English words start with DW, but there are some examples. There's dwarf, dwell, dwindle, and dweeb. Similarly, very few English words end with LB, but there also are some examples of this. We have bulb and related words such as light bulb and flash bulb. So the fact that such constraints exist now raises the question of what effect will these constraints and tend tendencies have on the crossword grid? And I think this question is especially interesting because normally when we discuss such constraints on the structure of words, we're talking about the usual way um, that language is presented as a one dimensional sequence of letters or sequence of sounds. But a crossword grid is two dimensional because you have across answers and down answers intersecting with each other. So we might expect that we have um, additional types of constraints and statistical patterns in the crossword grid that, we, that don't really come up in the normal flow of language. In order to investigate this question, what I've done is I created the most boring possible crossword. So what I mean by that is I went to the New York Times website and downloaded the 1,000 most recent uh, 15 by 15 crosswords, since this is the most standard crossword size. And then um, for each position in this 15 by 15 grid, I found the most common thing that appears in that position. Uh, so here's the 15 by 15 grid. I started out by going to the top left corner and seeing what's the most common letter to appear in this position. Then moved over one and figured out what's the most common letter to appear here and the most common letter to appear here. And I've been saying letter, but really I should be saying most common thing because for some positions it will be a black square is the most common thing rather than a letter. And once I've collected these most common things to fill each square, I then created the most boring possible crossword simply by filling each square in the grid with the most common thing that appears in that position. And here is what we get, a uh, thing of beauty. So a few initial observations about this uh, boring crossword puzzle. First, you'll notice that it has a ton of black squares in it, which makes sense because every crossword puzzle needs to have black squares, and the positions of the black squares are pretty variable across puzzles. So that's why when you aggregate across puzzles, you get lots of black squares. Another thing to notice is that this puzzle seems to have a theme. The theme is various ways to scream. Now, uh, unfortunately, this puzzle could not be published in a newspaper because it contains the word C repeated in three different positions. And newspaper crosswords usually have a rule that you are not allowed to repeat a word more than once in a puzzle. Um, but other than this repetition of C, of course, it would be an eminently publishable crossword. But now to dig a little bit deeper into what we can see from this um, aggregated cross crossword puzzle, it might seem obvious, but it's worth pointing out the simple fact that at different positions in the grid, we see different things. And the reason that this is not a trivial fact is if we suppose for a second that there are no constraints or tendencies acting on the structure of the grid, we would expect every position in the grid to be equivalent. That is, we would expect that every position in the grid would have as its most common letter, whichever letter is most common in English overall, namely the letter E. But the fact that we see different letters in different positions tells us that there are some constraints and tendencies that are shaping the space of which types of things can appear where. So let's take a closer look at what those constraints might be. And to start, we can focus in on um, a few specific positions in the grid. Uh, so let's start with the lower right-hand corner. And 
This square, just like every square in the crossword, is part of two different words, an across answer and a down answer. And if you think about this particular square, it's going to be the last letter of both of the words that it's part of. So whichever letter is going to fit in this square is probably going to be some letter that works really well as the last letter of English words. And S definitely fits that bill because you know pretty much any noun or verb could end with an S if you inflect it the right way. If we go to the top left corner of the grid, we now have the opposite scenario. Now, whichever letter appears here is going to be the first letter of two different answers, an across answer and a down, down answer. So when we're trying to find a letter that can go here, it should be some letter that works well as the first letter of English words. And A seems to fit that bill really well. If we go to this square, this one is going to be the second letter of both words it appears in. And it seems that O is the best letter to be the second letter of English words. In all three of those examples I just showed you, uh, the two directions that the letter appears in are giving the same sorts of pressures. For instance, the letter is the first letter of both words or the last letter of both words. But in other squares, we get some kind of conflicting pressures. For instance, the two squares that are circled here, um, in both cases, the letters in these positions will be the first letter of one answer, but the last letter of a different answer. And these conflicting pressures mean that um, the sorts of letters that can go in these spots will generally be the letters that work well as both the first letter of a word and the last letter of a word. And we can see that both of these most often end up being S, um, which makes sense because lots of English words start with S and lots of English words end with S. Another thing we can look at here is to focus in on a few specific letters. So one letter that's interesting for this purpose is letter Y. The thing that makes Y interesting is that it works really well as the last letter of an English word, lots of words end with Y, but not very well as the first letter of a word. Not many words start with Y. And we can see th this reflected in the grid. So first, if we look at the lower right-hand corner, we can see that Y is very common there. It accounts for this position in 9% of all crossword puzzles, which makes sense because this is the position where it will be the last letter of two words. So it's a great place for Y to appear. In the upper left-hand corner, however, um, whatever letter shows up here will be the first letter of two words, which is a bad place for Y to appear since Y is not the first letter of many words. So we can see that Y only fills this spot in 0.2% of crosswords, not 2%, 0.2%. And then if we look at the other two corners, the top right in green and the lower left in red, we'll see that the frequency of Y in both of these positions is kind of in between, which makes a lot of sense because in these positions, one of the directions has Y as the last letter and the other direction would have Y as the first letter, so it's sort of a blend of the two extremes we have of the 0.2% and the 9%. So it makes sense that the frequency of Y in these positions will be sort of in between the other positions. Another letter that's sort of the opposite of Y is C. So Y is great as the last letter of a word, but, or, but not very good as the first letter of a word. C is great as the first letter of a word, but not very good as the last letter of a word. So here we see the same basic structure as before, except flipped. Now C is very common in the top left of the grid, but very rare in the lower right of the grid. And just like before, um, the other two corners are sort of a mix, um, showing 2%, which is in between the frequency seen in the top left and lower right. Um, now let's take an even closer look at this position in the grid. So earlier, what I said was, uh, this position is filled with the letter A because both of the answers that this square will be part of We'll have this square be the first letter of that answer, and A is a good first letter of English words. But that's actually not the whole story. So in order to see why it's not the whole story, um, let's look at the plot here. And I know there's a lot in this plot, but I'll walk you through what it's showing. So the x-axis of this plot shows the 26 letters in the English alphabet. And then the y-axis shows the frequency for each of those letters. Uh, but the plot is showing two different types of frequency. The stripy pink bars are showing how common each letter is as the first letter of, an, of English words, um, where I just used the set of English words that appear in Wikipedia. And then the polka dotted blue bars show how common each letter is as the letter that fills the top left corner of crossword puzzles. And if we look at the letter A, we'll see that there's a pretty big discrepancy between these two bars. A shows up as the first letter of only 7% of English words, based on Wikipedia at least, but it shows up in the top left corner of 14% of crossword puzzles. So why is A so much more common in this top left position in crosswords than it is 
in terms of being the first letter of English words. To figure this out, we're going to realize that so far we've only exploited some of the information that we have about this position in the grid. The only information we've made use of so far is the fact that whichever letter goes in this position needs to be the first letter of two different words. But we actually know a little bit more about whatever is going to fill that position. We also know a little bit about the letters that are going to follow it. So in the across answer that features the red letter, we know that the letter that follows it will be whichever letter is in the purple position. And in the down answer that features the red letter, we know that whichever letter follows it will be whichever letter goes in the blue position. And we do know a little bit about these purple and blue letters. We know that the purple letter has to be the first letter of whichever down answer it's part of. And we know that the blue letter will have to be the first letter of whichever across answer it's part of. So this now gives us a bit more information about what sorts of things can go in the red position. That is, in addition to needing to be something that makes a good first letter of English words, it also needs to be something that can easily be followed by another good first letter of English words. Since we know that whatever letter this is, it's going to be followed by two other first letters, the purple and blue circles. So let's take a look at all of the common first letters of English words based on that Wikipedia data. Um, and let's think about, for example, the letter C. Even though C works really well as the first letter of the English words, it cannot very easily be followed by these other first letters. For instance, there are no English words I'm aware of that start with CS or CC or CP or CM. And there's a similar story for P. Even though P works great as a first letter on its own, it cannot very easily be followed by S or C or P or M. So if you look at all of these common first letters, the only two of them that can really easily be followed by the other common first letters are S and A. And if we go back to this plot here, you can see that both S and A are shown up much more commonly in this crossword position than they show up as the first letter of English words. So as we already saw with A, A is the first letter of only 7% of English words, but 14% of those top left corners of crosswords. And with S, it's 10%, uh, it's the first letter of 10% of English words, and it's the top left corner of 13% of crosswords. Uh, so this has helped us explain a bit why the letter A gets inflated so much in the crossword grid. But this is still not the complete story because we've explained why both S and A have their frequencies inflated here, why their blue bars are higher than their pink bars, but we still have not explained why the letter A gets so much more inflated in the crossword than S does. So you, you'll notice in the first letters of English words, S starts out as being more common than A. S is 10%, A is 7%. But in the crosswords, A has leapfrogged S to become more common than S. Uh, to figure out why A has leapfrogged S in this way, um, we need to consider one more aspect of crossword constructing, which is that when you're filling in a crossword puzzle as a constructor, reasonably often you'll be in a scenario where there's some particular position that needs to have a consonant in it, but just to make everything else around it work. And you'll also pretty often be in a position where um, some spot in the grid needs to have a vowel in it. So if you're in a situation where this top left corner the red part um, needs to have a consonant in it, you have lots of consonants to choose from, S, C, P, M, R, B, D. Um, so that's not really going to favor any consonant especially much over other letters. But if you're in a scenario where you really need a vowel to go in that position, now there's really only one game in town. A is the only English letter that very commonly occurs as the first letter of English words. Of course, there are English words that start with the other letters, just not nearly as commonly as A. So this means that um, we can expect A to get some extra inflation in terms of its frequency in this corner of the crossword grid uh, based on the fact that um, when you need something to fill in a vowel niche, it, it sort of has cornered the market. So to recap, our analysis for why the letter A dominates the top left of crossword grids comes down to three things. First, it's a common first letter of English words. Um, second, it can easily be followed by other common first letters. And third, it can easily fill the vowel niche uh, when a vowel is needed. There was a, a question that came in about the uh, question marks at the end of cues, clues for the puzzles. Um, uh, 
Uh, Michelle, any specific question marks? Michelle Bauer said, why do some clues have question marks and others not? Yeah, I think there are two different reasons you'll get question marks. Um, so what the question mark does is that it tells you there's some wordplay going on. So I think sometimes writer, writers and ed editors will put in the question marks just to make the puzzle a little bit easier. Um, if there's some extra tricky clue that they don't want you to get too stuck on. Um, and other times people use it to give themselves a little more leeway. Uh, so sometimes when you have one of these tricky wordplay laden clues, it won't exactly work, but the constructors will still decide it's worth it just because it's a fun enough piece of wordplay. Uh, so using that question mark kind of um, lets you indicate that you know you're playing fast and loose with the language. So I think that's the other reason you'll see it. And Dragomir asked, why isn't that grid symmetric? <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great question, Drago. Yeah, so <laughs> for people who aren't familiar, um, usually crossword puzzles, have a type of symmetry where you can rotate the grid 180 degrees and it will stay the same um, in terms of where the black squares are. And this grid is not like that. So for instance, you'll see in the top right here, we have these two EE letters next to each other, but in the bottom left, there's only one letter. And so that's a little puzzling because in most crossword puzzles, the black squares will be exactly symmetric. So the thing that throws it off though, is that occasionally crossword puzzles have other types of symmetry. Sometimes they just have left, right mirror symmetry. And that's what um, throws off the symmetry when we aggregate across all these puzzles. Yeah, you know, we can give people another minute. If there's one more question, oh, maybe. And actually, there's still people coming in through the waiting room. <laughs> oh, wow. I wanted to, wanted to welcome uh, those folks who just joined us in the last few minutes. Uh, we're having a little stretch break now, and uh, Tom is answering some questions that were in the chat. Um, oh, somebody asked if uh, you have an interest in British crosswords, where hmm. conventions are slightly different. Yes. Yeah, so I don't have too much experience with them, um, either as a solver or a constructor. But yeah, I especially think that their clues can be fun. Uh, so British clues take the trickery that you see in American crossword clues and just take it several orders of magnitude further. Um, it, yeah, in order to even solve a British crossword puzzle, there are all sorts of rules you often have to learn. Um, so I do really enjoy the few of them that I have solved, but they're so different that it's almost a different beast entirely. Um, and the British grids also do look different. So in American grids, every white square has to be part of um, both an across answer and a down answer, whereas in British grids, that's not the case. And another uh, question is, did you find any correlations between length of clues and positions of letter? I guess in the simple example, there aren't too many long clues. Right. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't really looked at the length of the clue. Um, but yeah, there might be some interesting stuff there. One thing you might expect is that, in general, I think that the trickier clues or clues with wordplay in them are generally longer than more straightforward clues, because sometimes to make the wordplay work, um, it, you need to have a long enough phrase to sort of contort the language in the right way. Now, the most elegant wordplay clues are shorter, and most of the ones I've shown you here are some of my favorite examples, which is why they tended to be shorter. But in general, I think that the short clues will usually be the sort of straightforward definitional ones like capital of Canada or a simple synonym, like the clue will be large and the answer will be big, something like that. And there was a comment about the question mark question. Uh, you'll see question marks also because as Will says, they are clues, not definitions. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. I assume that's Will Shorts. <laughs> I love listening to the Sunday puzzle on NPR. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, he really wears a lot of different uh, puzzling hats. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? Should we uh, get back into it or give people? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just wanted to let all of the participants know that um, you will be getting our next newsletter. 
Um, I've uh, taken the liberty of adding you to our mailing list. And if you don't want to receive our newsletter, you can unsubscribe. But, uh, it does uh, let you know about uh, events like this that we are sponsoring and about uh, other things going on in the language world. Very cool. And uh, you have some, some, I don't know if you can see the, the chat, Tom, but there's several people who are saying, you're doing great. Oh, thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, I didn't see that. So thanks for mentioning it. I'll check out the chat after. Oh, and there you go. Um, okay, so let me go back to where go we left off. Um, okay, yeah, so I was just talking about um, the different constraints and statistical tendencies that arise in the crossword grid and um, uh, the causes for these different patterns that we observe. Um, but I don't just want to talk about English in this talk. Um, so I want to now say a few words about some other languages and the types of wordplay that can show up in other languages and how that might be different from, from the types of wordplay we get in English. So to start off, I'm going to just focus on um, two particular positions in the crossword grid that we talked about earlier, the positions in red here, the top right corner and the lower left corner. And as I mentioned earlier, whichever letter goes in this position will need to be the first letter of one answer, but the last letter of a different answer. So this means that in order for these squares to be easy to fill in, you'll want your language to have the property that the same sorts of letters which tend to be the first letter of a word will also be the same sorts of letters that tend to be the last letter of a word. Um, and in order to think about this, I'm going to focus just on the two most basic categories of letters, namely consonants versus vowels. So if we first look at English, we can try to see uh, which types of letters tend to be the first letters of English words versus the last letters of English words. And if we look across an English word list, we'll get that 81% of English words start with a consonant while the remaining 19% start with vowels. And if we then look at last letters, we'll see that 72% of English words start with a consonant and the remaining 28%, or sorry, end with a consonant and the remaining 28% end with a vowel. So in English, it does seem like the first position and the last position of words is pretty similar. In both cases, it's dominated by consonants over vowels. But now let's look at a different language, Italian, which has a somewhat different word structure from English. In Italian, the first letters look a lot like um, the first letters in English. So in Italian, 77% of words start with a consonant and the remaining 23% start with a vowel, um, which is similar to English, but also dominated by consonants. But Italian looks very different when you look at the last letter. Italian words overwhelmingly end with vowels, not consonants. So 86% of Italian words and with vowels, which means that in Italian, unlike in English, the first letter and last letter are pretty different in terms of what things go there. Um, in English, both of those positions are usually consonants, but in Italian, they tend to start with a consonant but end with a vowel, which means that if you were trying to construct a crossword puzzle in Italian, you would probably have more trouble filling in those two corners in the grid, the top right and lower left, than you would have filling out the same positions in English. Uh, but just because this property of Italian will make it harder to fill in that position in the crossword grid, um, it might make Italian better suited for some other types of wordplay than English would be. Um, so specifically, the type of wordplay I have in mind, using a somewhat uh, general definition of wordplay, is rhyming. To look at this, I'm going to consider Dante's Inferno, the epic poem that was originally written in Italian. Here I've put up the first few stanzas of the Inferno, in the original Italian. And even if you don't speak Italian, it's easy to observe the intricate rhyme scheme that Dante invented for this poem. First, within each stanza, the first line and the third line rhyme. But that's not where the rhyming ends. In addition, across stanzas, we get that the middle line of any stanza will rhyme with the first and third lines of the following stanza. For instance, forte in the middle of this second stanza rhymes with morte and scorte in the following stanza. So overall, um, this rhyme scheme gives a really intricate interlocking effect, where on the one hand, you have some unity within each stanza from the first and third lines rhyming, but you also have some connections across stanzas from that middle line that helps anticipate what's going to come forward. So overall, this gives an effect of um, relentlessly marching forward through the poem as the characters in the poem are relentlessly forced through the circles of the underworld. 
And in Italian, it's relatively easy to have a poem with such an intricate rhyme scheme, because as we already saw, Italian words tend to end in vowels, and there are only so many vowels, which means that um, for any given Italian word, it's usually not that hard to find other words that end in the same way, i.e. that rhyme with it. In English, though, rhyming is harder. In the words of one translator of the Inferno, English is a rhyme-poor language. This means that um, when people have translated the Inferno in the past, they've often had to make compromises when it comes to translating Dante's rhyme scheme. For instance, some translators have given up entirely on having any sort of rhyme. So these are the same lines we already saw, um, but in the Hollander translation of the Inferno, and you can see there's no rhyming whatsoever. That these translators did their best to replicate the meaning of Dante's words without worrying about the form. In another case, the one show, shown here, the translator replicated part of the rhyme scheme, but not all of it. That is, he kept the fact that the first and third lines within each stanza rhyme, but he gave up on having the middle lines of the stanzas do anything. So we can see, for example, that astray and say rhyme with each other, but the word myself is not doing anything for the rhyme scheme. It does not rhyme with drear and fear. This translator here did preserve the entire structure of Dante's rhyme scheme, but in order to do that, he compromised on what counts as a rhyme. That is, under his definition of rhyming, a pair of words rhymes as long as they both end with the same consonant sound, ignoring whatever vowels come before it. For instance, in the first stanza, you can see that myself and rough count as a rhyme. And looking at the red words near the end, we have sleep, stop, and up counting as a rhyme. Finally, a few brave souls have endeavored to um, entirely preserve Dante's rhyme scheme. Uh, so this translation did that, for example. And even though I admire their bravery in doing this, in order to make it work, they've usually had to compromise a bit on the quality of the writing. For instance, even just looking at the first line here, um, it goes halfway through the journey of our life's way. It seems pretty clear that the word way is kind of unnecessary here. This line could be written just as well as halfway through the journey of our life or halfway through our life's journey. Uh, so it seems pretty clear that the word way has been added here pretty much gratuitously in order to force the rhyme scheme. Um, so overall, that same property of Italian that will make it harder to fill in certain positions in the crossword grid makes it much easier to write poetry in Italian. Um, and some people might even argue that poetry is more valuable uh, for a society than crossword puzzles. Um, in fairness to the translators, I should mention that translation um, is also just a more constrained medium than creating original poetry. So when Dante was writing the original Inferno, he did have the freedom to structure the narrative in a way that made it easy to rhyme, whereas translators don't have that freedom. So that probably is an additional factor that's making it hard to preserve the rhyme scheme in translation, not just the differences between the languages. Okay, so these observations about rhyming give an example of how um, some types of wordplay might be easier in other languages than English, but still possible in English. Of course, we still can rhyme in English. There are other types of wordplay, though, that are possible in some other languages, but not possible at all in English. One such type of wordplay comes from word order. That is, in English, our word order is relatively rigid. For most English sentences, if you rearrange the words in the sentence, the sentence would either have a different meaning or it would become ungrammatical. But there are other languages with much more flexible word order, where you can rearrange the words without really changing the meaning much. And in such languages, uh, if a writer is writing in one of these languages, this means that they could manipulate the word order um, for literary effect. So one of my favorite examples of this comes from the Aeneid, which was originally written in Latin, which is one such language that has a more flexible word order. Um, and so this is an example I've learned about from uh, Connie Ramsey, who I think is here today. So the sentence in the original Aeneid, in the original Latin, goes Speluncum dido dux et Troianus aeondem doeniant, which in English would normally be translated something like Dido and the Trojan leader arrive into the same cave. And if you only look at the English translation, the sentence is completely unremarkable. To see why it's such a cool sentence, you have to look at the original Latin word order. If we translate the Latin word by word, we get cave dido leader and Trojan, same, arrive. And the thing that makes me love this sentence so much is that the phrase Dido and the Trojan leader is literally surrounded by the phrase same cave. 
So the word order of the sentence reflects the meaning of the sentence, which is something you just can't really do in English. There's also a second way that the word order of the sentence um, reflects the properties of the story. It relates to the word leader, dukes. So in the translation I've shown here, um, leader modifies Trojan, but there is another way that you can interpret the word leader. It would be equally grammatical for it to modify the word Dido before it. So there is an alternate translation of this line that would be the leader Dido and the Trojan arrive into the same cave. Um, now, I think the default translation has leader refer to Trojan because the Trojan in question here is Aeneas, the protagonist of the poem. So since he's the protagonist, readers are sort of intended to sympathize with him. And so he's probably the one that the intended audience would be more likely to interpret as a leader. Um, there might also be some sexism here because Aeneas is a guy and Dido is a woman. But if you look at the word order, Dukes is actually closer to Dido than it is to Trojan. So there's also good reason to think that maybe the leader is referring to Dido. And in addition, at this point in the story, um, it really is unclear which one of these two characters has more power. Uh, so I think it's very impressive how Virgil was able to use the flexible sentence structure of Latin um, to have the structure of the line reflect the ambiguity of the character's relationship in the story. To give one final example of how different languages can permit different types of wordplay, I wanna say a bit about sign languages. Um, so first, just to clear up some common misconceptions about sign languages, people often think that sign languages are simply some sort of code for the spoken languages that are used in the same geographic area. For example, people might think that American Sign Language is just a code for English, but that's not the case. Um, sign languages are complete languages in their own right with their own structure, grammar, and vocabulary. One easy way to tell that is that signers of American Sign Language and signers of British Sign Language cannot understand each other, even though American English and British English are the same language, just different dialects. Um, so the examples I have about uh, wordplay and sign languages come from these two works by Rachel Sutton Spence and Donna Jo Napoli. And a first type of wordplay that you'll see in sign languages comes from the uh, visual nature of these languages. Uh, one example I really enjoyed from those works I mentioned um, is about a joke told in British Sign Language, where the joke involves some reindeer telling Santa Claus that they're running late for Christmas. So that punchline, we're running late for Christmas, is not especially funny when you tell the joke in English. Um, but when you tell the joke in British Sign Language, there's a manipulation that the um, signer of the joke will use. Normally, the sentence, we're running late for Christmas, would be signed pretty close to your waist. But when you tell this joke, you instead form the signs up near your forehead, which is meant to create the visual impression that if a reindeer were to sign in British Sign Language, the reindeer would sign using its antlers, um, which I think is a pretty entertaining image. And that sort of uh, visual humor is possible in sign languages, but not really in spoken languages. Another aspect of sign languages that enables some other type of wordplay relates to their temporal structure. In a spoken language, it is not possible to utter two words at the same time. In sign languages, however, there are some words whose sign requires just one hand, which means that it, for those words, it is possible to sign two of them at the same time. You just make one sign with your left hand and the other one with your right hand. So the authors um, mention an example of a British sign language signer who wanted to convey that he was feeling mixed emotions. He was feeling both confident and unconfident at the same time. So to convey that, he made the sign for confident with one hand and at the same time made the sign for um, unconfident with the other hand. Um, that's the end of the discussion of the crossword grid. And I've talked a lot about the formal properties of language and of crossword puzzles. But I want to close by talking a bit about the broader human context of crosswords and of language. To start out, I'm going to share one of my favorite quotes from uh, linguists Herb Clark and Michael Schober in a paraphrased form from Dan Jurafsky. The quote goes, the common misconception is that language has to do with words and what they mean. It doesn't. It has to do with people and what they mean. Uh, so I like how this quote really highlights the importance of people to language and the importance of language to people. And I think this point will also resonate with a lot of crossword puzzles, because for many people, crosswords are also all about uh, human connection. 
For example, I first got into crossword puzzles by solving them with my family or with family friends, everyone clustered around the kitchen table, uh, occasionally shouting out a clue into the next room, if there was someone else elsewhere in the house who knew more about the clues topic. Um, so I think it is really important to um, not just focus on those formal properties that we've been discussing, but also to think about the, the fact that language really is a human phenomenon. And a particular aspect of the human side of language I want to focus on is the fact that language belongs to all of us and is created by all of us. It's not created by people who write dictionaries or by a grammar academy. Instead, um, all of us collaboratively decide how the language should look and how it should evolve. And my favorite expression of that fact comes from Gretchen McCulloch, who writes, language is humanity's most spectacular open source project. That is, language is sort of like Wikipedia. It's something that all of us collaboratively edit and change over time. And in terms of the history of crossword puzzles, there's actually an interesting parallel um, to this view of language as something that encompasses all of human experience. So to talk about that, I'm going to share a little bit of crossword history, uh, focusing on two uh, black and white objects, crossword puzzles and Oreo cookies. It starts in 1912, which was the year that Oreo cookies were first sold. Uh, shortly after, 1913, was the year when Arthur Wynn invented the crossword puzzle. It took a few decades, but eventually the New York Times uh, signed on to this uh, growing crossword craze and began publishing crossword puzzles in 1942. A bit after that, the word Oreo made the first of many appearances in the New York Times crossword puzzle. And in this first appearance of the word Oreo in 1952, its clue was mountain colon comb form, which seems utterly perplexing. Uh, I mean, when I first saw this, I didn't even know how on earth, the, earth this leads to the answer Oreo. So interpret, to interpret that clue, a first thing to know is that the COMB here is short for combining, where combining form is sort of an older term to mean a prefix or suffix. That, it's, that is, it's the form of a word that you use when you want to combine it with other word parts. And it turns out that there is an obscure prefix that means mountain um, and which has the form Oreo. A few examples of words that have that prefix. There's an extinct group of hoofed animals called Oreodonts, where Oreodont means mountain tooth, and apparently these animals had mountain-shaped teeth. There's also a genus of hummingbirds called Oreotrochilus, meaning mountain hummingbird, because they live in the Andes. And finally, you may have heard of Australopithecus, well, there's also Oreopithecus, which is an extinct hominoid primate uh, found in the hills of Italy. So uh, clearly, if Nabisco ever wants to have a mascot for Oreo cookies, they have a lot of great options to choose from here. Um, but even though this is a real prefix, it still leaves open the question of why on earth, if you need to write a clue for the word Oreo, why on earth would you choose this obscure prefix rather than the really well-known and well-loved cookie? And the answer is that during this period in crossword history, the prevalent view was that crosswords should only contain um, highbrow topics and highbrow language. Uh, so for instance, um, slang and brand names such as Oreo were frowned upon. References to pop culture were frowned upon unless they were kind of the educated types of pop culture like the opera or classical mythology. So under that sort of worldview, that's why this obscure prefix was a better choice for the editor than um, the much better known cookie. And um, starting from this first appearance in 1952, over the next few decades, Oreo appeared 106 times in the New York Times crossword. And of those 106 times, 65 of them were clued as mountain colon prefix. Another 39 were clued as mountain colon comb form, the one we've already seen. Uh, one more instance was a sh slightly shorter version, clued as mount colon comb form. And then the final example does mention the fact that Oreos are cookies, but it still is not able to escape um, this ever-present mountain association. The final clue is mountainous cookie. Uh, so you'll, you'll notice that the time range I've given here ends in 1993. So what changed in 1993? That was the year when Will Schwartz became the crossword editor of the New York Times. And he belonged to a group of crossword personalities known as the New Wave. 
um, because they disagreed with that prevalent view that crosswords should only contain um, technical formal language and highbrow references. They believed that the crossword puzzle and its answers and clues should reflect the diversity of the people who are solving the crossword. Uh, so the new wave viewpoint was that we should embrace with open arms um, all the different facets of language. So a few months after Will Shorts took over, um, Oreo showed up for the first time in a crossword puzzle edited by Will Shorts, uh, constructed by David A. Rosen. Um, and the clue for this instance of Oreo was cream-filled sandwich. Finally, no references to mountains in sight. And uh, since then, Oreo has appeared many more times. So once again, these were all of the different clues we saw for Oreo in the pre-Shorts era. But now here's just a small sampler of the clues we've seen for it during Will Shorts's tenure. We've seen popular name for a black and white pet, black pie crust component, dirt pie ingredient, blank O's breakfast cereal, and certain froyo add-in. And it seems clear as day that the second set of clues is so much more interesting and so much more lively than the various ways of referring to that mountain prefix. So I think Will Schwartz really did a great service to the crossword community um, by encouraging this change in crossword puzzle style to embrace all the different sides of our language and all the different sides of our culture. And this change does not just apply to crossword puzzle, or to Oreos. So I went over um, just a few of the crosswords from the past few months and wrote down um, just some of the cultural references that appeared in them. And we'll see, we still will see some of the uh, more highbrow types of topics that appeared in older crossword puzzles like the opera or mythology. But we also see um, much more informal um, topics, colloquial slang, um, so we've got the Holy Roman Empire, P.F. Chains, The Simpsons, Aretha Franklin, To Kill a Mockingbird, Wonder Woman, Doctor Who, Ginger Rogers, Emile Zola, um, Tess of the Durbervilles, RuPaul's Drag Race, The Lion King, The Selma to Montgomery March, William Jennings Bryan, Emperor Nero, Emperor Hirohito, El Cid, West Side Story, Princess Leia, General Leia, Tay Diggs, AP Chemistry, Soul Train, The Alamo, Osiris, 101 Dalmatians, 101 Arabian Nights, Patty Lupone, Othello, Europa, Richard Scarry, Anigo Montoya, Taco Bell, The Marx Brothers, Captain Ahab, Odin, Crazy Rich Asians, Cher, Errol Flynn, The Little Mermaid, Anne Hathaway, The Actress, Anne Hathaway, Shakespeare's Wife, Hamilton, Sherlock Holmes, Bambi Meets Godzilla, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Matcha, Groupon, Ernest Hemingway, Gustav Mahler, Mahalia Jackson, Manowar, Dmitry Mendeleev, iPhones, Michelin stars, Elastigirl, Simone Biles, Monopoly, Anything Goes, Doritos, Ride Sharing, Sesame Street, The Pantheon, Smart Homes, and of Green Gables. And then my personal favorite category, uh, colloquial expressions you would use in everyday conversation, such as or not, amen to that, I am so there, let's see, BFFs, bring it on. Uh, so I think from all these examples, um, it's pretty clear how crosswords have come to reflect the richness of our language, which in turn reflects the diversity of our culture. Of course, there's still a long ways to go. It still remains the case that not all voices are equally represented in the squares of the crossword grid. For instance, it remains the case that the group of people who create crossword puzzles are predominantly white and predominantly male. Um, but there are steps being taken to address this problem. The New York Times has recently diversified its editorial staff, and there are also several new so-called indie crossword venues, which have been created to highlight the work of groups of people who have traditionally not published as much um, in, in newspaper crosswords. Okay, so there, we've come to the end of the presentation. I hope I've been able to show some of the many ways in which crossword puzzles and linguistics can shed light on each other. In part one, I discussed crossword clues and how they make us aware of types of ambiguity that we don't normally notice. In part two, I discuss the crossword grid, its linguistic structure, and the limitations on that structure. In part three, I discussed how our language belongs to all of us, and how crossword puzzles have come to own that diversity instead of shunning it. Crossword puzzles highlight the power and the richness of our words, demonstrating how language refuses to be contained inside a few tidy little boxes. 
Hey, uh, so now we have some time for Q&A, but first I would also like to acknowledge the many uh, crossword websites and blogs that helped me compile all the uh, clues and answers I showed here. So there's the Xword info, info blog created by Jim Horn and uh, currently run by Jeff Chen, Wordplay by Deb Amlin, the Rex Parker blog by Michael Sharp, a Diary of a Crossword Fiend, specifically posts in it written by Amy Reynaldo and Sam Donaldson, Matt Ginsburg's Clue Database, uh, crosswordies.com and crosswordtracker.com. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we have several questions in the chat. And if anybody would like to, you know, click on the hand button and raise your hand to ask a question, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read a couple of them that came in earlier on the chat. Uh, how many crosswords do you solve in a week, Tom? About seven. I usually solve just the New York Times one. Okay. Um, and I think uh, Linda asked about the uh, similar statistical studies for crosswords in non-English languages. Yeah, so I have not done that, but I think that would be really interesting to look at. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the you know very small number of thoughts I had about Italian, but would love to run the full analyses for other languages. Um, yeah, and in particular, some things that make certain other languages interesting is that they have um, sometimes different conventions about how the writing system works or how the writing system is entered into a crossword puzzle. For instance, in Japanese, uh, the writing systems they use for crosswords have one symbol per syllable instead of one symbol per letter. Per letter. So you might expect that to change the structure. Um, and I've also heard that Normally when you write Hebrew in the writing, you don't write down the vowels, but then to make crossword puzzles, you do include the vowels. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to explore um, with other languages. And then uh, Michelle had a historical question, where did crosswords start? And are they common in all languages? Yeah, so uh, the one that's traditionally considered the first one uh, was created in the UK. Um, there are some older precursors. I don't know too much about them though. And I do think they're pretty common across languages, although I don't know too much um, about that. Okay. And um, let's see, any advice for budding crossword writers? Um, let me think. Well, one, I guess my main piece of advice is just keep at it because um, it's very, very hard when you're getting started. It just takes forever to fill in the crossword grid. It's incredibly difficult to get all the words to interlock. Um, and it's also very normal to get tons of crosswords rejected. So I know I had four or five rejected before my first one was accepted to be published. Um, and still around half of the crosswords I submit are about are rejected. Uh, so just keep at it, don't get discouraged. And then there are also some um, resources you can go to. So there's a great book by Patrick Berry called something like Crossword Constructing for Dummies, which is a great place to start. Um, there's also a Facebook group called um, Crossword Puzzle Collaboration Directory, which you can use to connect with um, more experienced crossword constructors who can give you advice on how to get started. Um, Candace, I, I think this is her advice. Pen, only way to go. <laughs> I think that's to write the crossword, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, if you're bold enough. And um, I was answering see. somebody else's comment. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I did recently see someone say that, you know, the old question was, do you solve in paper or pencil? But now it's changed to uh, paper or computer. Uh -huh. All right. Hello. And, uh, Hello. Um, Oreo, the prefix Oro comes from the Greek word Oros, which means mountain. Okay. It makes a lot of sense, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's nice. My pleasure, great lecture. Thank you. I wonder where the Oreo cookie came from because it seems unlikely that they would have had the Greek word in mind, but maybe they did. No idea. Mm -hmm. And actually there was another uh, question from Matt. Matt, do you wanna ask your question about contrived answers? Come on your mic. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. I think at, at the ver like earlier towards the start of your lecture, you mentioned contrived answers and the, how those throw um, 
puzzle takers for a loop. Do you consider those a form of Hopbox legomena? And if you do, uh, how does Hopbox legomena like pose a unique challenge in crosswords? Yeah. So um, yeah. So Hopbox legomena, for people who don't know, are words that only show up one time in some corpus or collection of text. Um, yeah. So it would make a lot of. So I guess it sort of depends on what you're considering the corpus of text. So for example, some of these contrived answers probably have shown up multiple times. Um, like, um, yeah, like I know I've seen some of the shorter words like re-oil has definitely shown up multiple times. So that one would not count as a hotbox legomenon because it's occurred multiple times. Um, but the ones that only show up once would occur, or would qualify, I think. Um, and there definitely is a sort of prestige in being the first crossword constructor to use some word in a crossword. Um, although I would say you only get that sort of prestige if it's a good, um, fun, fresh new word. So you probably would not get it for being the first person to use, um, you know, re-intakers or something like that. All right, thank you, Matt. So I could not pronounce that. <laughs> I wanted to let you do that. Um, let's see, Candace, do you want to ask your question about crafting? Puzzles? Uh, hi, Tom. So I was wondering when you craft your own crossword puzzles, do you begin with a word, a sound, a play on words, or a theme? Yeah, usually I start with the theme. Um, so actually, that's one aspect of crosswords I did not really get into here, but um, many of the crossword puzzles in newspapers have a theme, which is something that unites all the long answers in the puzzle. Um, yeah, so usually uh, I'll just, you know, be going throughout my daily life and something I hear will make me think of a crossword theme. Um, so for instance, just once I was thinking about the phrase, it is what it is, which if you think about it, um, it's kind of an interesting phrase because it doesn't seem like it means very much. It's sort of definitionally true that it is what it is. So then I started thinking about other common expressions that have that um, property like, um, it ain't over till it's over, um, haters gonna hate, and built up a whole crossword theme out of these expressions. So to do that, you just think of as many expressions as you can that fill the theme. And uh, then you start building the grid, which is the hardest part. First, you just put in your theme answers into the grid and then decide where the black squares will go around those theme answers. And then the hard part is figuring out how um, all the words will interlock. So when I got started, I was doing that just with graph paper and pencil. Um, which is very hard, lots of wearing through paper from erasing. Um, since then, I've switched to doing it on a computer where there are software programs that can help with that. And then once you filled in the grid, then you write the clues, which is a, a more fun part because um, you can just sort of, uh, it, it's less constrained than filling in the grid is. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, another question from Dragomir. Do you want to ask yours about the database? Yeah, Tom, great talk. Uh, so my question is when you write those puzzles, you say you use a computer to help you fill the grid and, all, and organize things, but do you use a large database of candidate words to be suggested automatically? I do, yeah. Yeah, so the program I use is Crossword Compiler, which comes with just kind of a standard dictionary of English words. Um, and over time, I've added to that dictionary um, just with some more, you know, colloquial or slangy terms. Um, yeah, so usually what I do is I'll have a mixture of, as I'm filling the crossword, I'll think, okay, it looks like here I need an eight letter word that ends with D, and then I'll try to think of any um, particularly fun words that I could use for that slot, and I'll try to fill that in. So that part's entirely manual, but then when I get stuck, I will use the um, large word list built up from the crossword compilers default word list to um, get suggestions. Yeah, thank you. And since I, I'm asking you a question, let me ask you a quick one. You had a puzzle that was based on a Yale linguistics course with words with the pronunciation. Do you want to mention it briefly? Um, yeah, or actually I'm not sure which one you're talking about because um, I actually have several uh, different crosswords I've made based on linguistics classes I've taken. I guess since when I'm in a linguistics class. You had said that uh, 
<clears throat> you learned it in one of the linguistics classes and the professor had told you that there were very few examples of those words right. in English? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I was taking a class in phonology, which is the study of the sound structure of language. Um, and what our professor mentioned is that, you know, in English, like in many languages, we have stress in our words. But um, uh, unlike certain other properties of words, stress very rarely is used to distinguish two words. So for example, in the talk, I mentioned how um, we can distinguish the word thistle and thistle based on which type of th you have. So there, the version of th is used to distinguish two words, but it's rare to have two words that differ only by their stress. Um, and since our professor mentioned how rare it is, that made me want to find out which ones there were and ended up building a crossword puzzle around that. So some examples were um, the word conquered, as in C-O-N-Q-U-E-R-E-D, and the word concurred, C-O-N-C-U-R-R-E-D. So the answer I had in the crossword puzzle was, I came, I saw, I concurred. Instead of I came, I saw, I conquered. Or another one is, um, um, let me think. Yeah, I'm actually, um, yeah, I'm forgetting the other examples now, but that's the one example should illustrate the idea. Uh, there's several comments about Oreos. Elizabeth, uh, would you like to explain uh, your comment about the origin of the cookie name? Uh, Elizabeth Tidwell? You're muting. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yes, I, I went up online and um, according to the thought company, um, uh, one of the donations for it is that there was a shaped kind of cookie that was tested originally. So that goes back perhaps to the mountain um, idea. Uh, another was that it they took the RE from cream and uh, since chocolate had two O's in it, they just put, um, they, they put Oreo. And another was that it would be a fun word to announce, but that there was never any real um, explanation given for the name. Maybe their motivation was um, so that they would get lots of free advertising from crossword puzzles. <laughs> well, I guess they predated crossword puzzles, so that can't be it. But if you're ever founding a company, um, yeah, if you have lots of vowels in the name, you'll get that free advertising. Actually, Chris, do you want to uh, share your bit of information about when Oreo cookies were introduced? Uh, I'm sure. I just I just looked up Oreos and noticed that they were introduced in 1912, and the crosswords were introduced in the U.S. the following year. So theoretically, that first crossword that was published by Arthur Wynn could have had Oreo as a um, as an answer. Definitely quite a coincidence, temporally. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Nicholas said the IPA crossword. Uh, would that, that have been, I guess, a linguistics uh, class crossword? Yeah, yeah. So over the summer, um, I made a crossword puzzle that was in the International Phonetic Alphabet um, instead of in uh, the usual English writing system. Yeah, so that's actually on my website um, if, if you're a fan of IPA and want to try solving it. Oh, yes, and we should probably share the link to your, your website. Uh, do you want to... Uh, Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll just type it in. The... Yeah, type, I'll type it in the chat there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, John asks, are, about, are most crosswords still written by humans? Yes. Huh? Or at least <laughs> the, uh, sort of big name newspaper crosswords. There probably are some um, computer generated ones in sort of, um, you know, like the checkout counter magazine type venues. But in terms of the New York Times, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, all these ones are made by humans. And I think one big reason for that is the fact that these puzzles um, still include the themes, as I mentioned, which are just very hard for a computer to come up with. And I guess the other tricky thing is that even though it's possible to fill in a crossword puzzle with a computer, in some sense, the computers are too good. They know too many words, which means that if you just tell it to fill in the grid, it will fill it in with all sorts of obscure things that um, a human solver would not really be especially entertained by, whereas a human constructor knows how to tell um, which words will be interesting to people. And in addition, a computer has to work from some pre-specified word list, whereas a computer or whereas a human 
um, is keeping up with what's going on in the outside world and might realize new names of movies or new newly coined words that they could include in a crossword puzzle to entertain people. And uh, Dan Williams asked about your favorite, the favorite clue that you've written. Oh, yeah, let's see. So I have two. One of them I like just because it's very silly. The clue was um, actress Kidman, who is neither a kid nor a man. And the answer is Nicole. And then the other one is tricky. The clue was line of latitude. And the answer was, it's up to you. So there, their interpretation is that when you say line, um, you have to interpret that as meaning a line as in something a person says, like a line in a movie. And then latitude in the context of this clue is interpreted as um, freedom of action. Like you might say, the teacher gives his students a lot of latitude in what their essays are about. So a line of latitude would be something you say that expresses, expresses freedom of action, such as it's up to you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Sajika, homophones, uh, I think says homophones are quite common. Now, Sajida, I think you're joining us from uh, the UK, right? Unfortunately, you came in late. Did you want to say hello and ask your question or make your comment? Hi, yes. Um, I didn't have another question. I was, I think you were referring to homophones earlier when you were talking about words that, two words that kind of sound the same but the spelling is different and the meaning is different or the spelling can be different and the, but the meaning is definitely different um, and they are quite a common type of clue on a cryptic crossword they're normally uh, indicated through another type of word um, which is like an indicator word which is something like speaking or shouting or broadcasting um, that, that would require me to go into the rules of cryptic crosswords which would probably be quite confusing right now but um yeah that was just a comment really no that's good to know yeah um yeah and, and i mean i think it is yeah fun to know that is the basic structure of a lot of cryptic clues they'll have sort of an indicator word that tells you what type of wordplay to expect and then um the actual some content of the clue that refers to that indicator word but the tricky thing is that it's not always so clear um what's an indicator and what's not so for example a typical cryptic clue might be something like tangled roots where you have to interpret the word tangled as an indicator word to show that um, you need to do an anagram, you need to rearrange letters, and then it's telling you to rearrange the letters of the word roots. So the answer might be torso because that's an anagram of roots. And, and um, as you're saying, it sounds like you have similar things where the type of wordplay is a homophone. Okay, uh, Eduardo, you have two questions. Would you like to ask them? Uh, one was about the, uh, let's see, I don't know if our Eduardo is with us here. Yeah, yeah still here. Maybe having problems with audio, but his questions were, um, aside from English, what other languages have a su significant culture of, of crosswords? Spanish? Yeah, I honestly don't know the answer, but yeah, other people might. No. Um. Okay. And then are there any significant differences between crosswords targeted to the US, Canada, and Australia? Hmm. That's a really good question. And I don't actually know. Um, yeah, so I think we have brought up how British and American crosswords are different. And I don't actually know if those other English speaking countries fall more on the American side or more on the British side. Okay. And I tell you, this username sounds like a, a crossword puzzle clue. Great refuse. <laughs> <laughs> or is it great <Craig> refuse? <laughs> Would you like to ask your question or make the play? Uh, sure, yeah, uh, that, that's, the... that's my name, which is Mark. So yes. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much analysis have you done in terms of like letter frequency? I love the the part where you talked about English versus Italian, but things like what is the minimal set of letters that you could use to make like a fifteen by fifteen grid or similar. Yeah, that's a great question. I have not looked at that, but um, I think that would be interesting. Yeah, and I think I saw you mentioned in the comments that you will occasionally see puzzles in newspapers, such as the New York Times, where the theme governing the puzzle is to use as few letters as possible. I think the smallest I've seen for that was eight letters. Um, another fun fact is that, um, 
there was a French author named um, Perec, I might be mispronouncing that, P-E-R-E-C, who's known for writing an entire novel that did not use the letter E. And apparently he was also a crossword constructor who would um, create crossword puzzles that had similar constraints on them, like not using the letter E. So yeah, that's def there's definitely a long tradition of looking into these questions with crosswords, but I don't know too much about it. And Gregory had another uh, multilingual question. Gregory, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hi, uh, your, your mention of an IPA uh, crossword uh, inspired me to wonder if it's uh, overly impractical to, uh, con to think about uh, multilingual crosswords being prepared, like maybe you could uh, put together English and Spanish or mm. uh, have uh, a, a crossword uh, to, uh, prepared that you prepare for the European Union. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I really like that idea of yeah, having like the crosswords being um, in one language and down in another language. That could be a fun way to um, help learn another language. And, and I think it would depend a lot on what the two languages are. Um, you know, so for one thing, if there are two languages with different writing systems, that would make it pretty hard. Although you could fix that by using the IPA, I guess. Um, but even there, it would depend on sort of whether the two languages have similar sound systems or not. So for example, if it were bilingual between say two Romance languages, that might be a lot easier than um, less similar languages. And uh, Ed, uh, you had a question for the British people in the audience. Uh, do you wanna ask that? <laughs> yeah, I think in the chat, there was some answer. My, uh, I, I can never do the British cryptic ones. I do a lot of crossword puzzles US and I find that I'm always woeful at solving the British ones. Um, but somebody from Britain responded that they also have the US style crosswords in Britain because I, I had always kind of assumed that Brits probably look down their nose at American crosswords because they seem much easier, at least to my brain, than, than the British ones are. So <laughs> We have the concise crosswords as well. So they are basically just like the US ones. Yeah. Um, we don't have the grid and um, the same. It's, it's as Tom described it previously. So you have lots more black space in, in between. But um, there are slightly different rules. And I actually think our concise are much easier than your crosswords. <laughs> and it's probably somewhere in between a cryptic yeah. and a concise because you throw in a few cryptic things but you don't quite do them in the same way yeah yeah i i have a group similar to what tom was talking about i have a group that is meeting even tonight every saturday night we meet now due to the pandemic to do crosswords online together um so i agree with what tom said that it's kind of a group activity that's a lot of fun to do but like I said, I'm, I'm woeful at doing the cryptic ones. I just, I've never been able to get the hang of those very well, so. <laughs> Definitely takes practice is what I've heard. And um, we had a question for about the recording of this. Uh, we'll, we'll be posting some highlights and uh, that will be on languagemuseum.org, which I will drop into the, the chat for you. I also wanted to thank everybody who had has joined as part of your registration. And I want to introduce uh, the president of the museum, Greg Nedved, who's now on. And I think, would you like to say a few words, uh, Greg? Uh, sure. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. And uh, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, believe it or not, I was, uh, this is my attempt at humor. I was working on a crossword puzzle and I really wanted to finish it in time. And uh, that's why I'm late. That's actually not true. I had some technical difficulties. <laughs> um, wonderful program, Tom. And this is uh, among our better ones in terms of turnouts. This is excellent. And I actually have a question. Again, I missed some of the early presentation. You may have touched on this. Um, but is there, any, is there any crossword puzzle competition out there? There is, yeah, there are several. So the longest running one I'm aware of um, is the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, which Will Schwartz founded in the 70s, I think. Um, and that tournament sort of doubles 
as the annual convention for all the crossword fans. So lots of people go there, even if they're not especially good at solving crosswords, just to see other um, crossword enthusiasts. And it's really a fun time. I've gone to a couple of them. Um, uh, yeah, so for example, there are people there who will walk up to you and tell you, did you know that your name is an anagram of X? And they'll have some anagram of your name they just thought of on the spot. Um, so it's really fun. Um, and there are also some other ones like, yeah, there's one in DC. I'm forgetting which one is the one in DC. I think it might be the Indy 500. Um, other crossword people might know, but so there are some crosswords called indie crosswords, like indie bands, they're independent crossword groups, um, which often have zanier themes. Uh, so I've heard that one's really fun, but haven't gone. Um, and there are many smaller ones throughout the country too. So yeah, if you just Google whichever city you live in, followed by crossword tournament, there's a reasonably good chance there's one there. Yeah, I was sure it was, um, because people just love crossword puzzles and they go at them very quickly. Again, I don't know what Jill said in terms of an introduction, but I want to, you know, thank you again for this presentation and to uh, thank you all for attending. Again, this has been a wonderful turnout and, uh, you know, we're always looking for help with our museum and we do have another speaker coming up, by the way, in December, uh, who's going to talk about the history of the American Translators Association. We have programs all the time and uh, they, came, they seem to be getting better and better all the time. Uh, so I guess, unless there are further questions, are we are we done? There now? are. <laughs> yeah. There are. <laughs> uh, you have some Karen, other questions. We'll I'll stop talking. Uh, Karen and Sophia, would you want to ask your question? Hi, um, I had a question about tonal languages such as Chinese. So in Chinese, there's something I'm sure you guys all know so called pinyin, which is what you use to create the words and characters. But what happens to the tones? Like. Do they just include those into the crossword puzzle? That's a great question. I actually don't know for sure if um, China has much of a crossword culture. Um, uh, I do know that at least for some of the European languages, which use you know alphabetic systems rather than um, the characters you see in Chinese, um, some of the European languages in their normal writing system will have diacritics on a lot of the letters. And often the convention in crossword puzzles will be to omit those diacritics. Um, so I would imagine that you might get a similar thing um, in a tonal language, but I don't know for sure. Well, actually, uh, Greg, are you still on? Uh, Greg, Greg is a Chinese linguist. I think actually, Laura, you've done some work with Chinese too, right? <laughs> I've never seen. Um, uh, a Chinese crossword puzzle that uh, used actual Chinese characters, but I have seen them using pinyin. In other Do they have the tones? To be honest, I never paid that much attention to it. I don't mm. think they did though, uh, but I don't don't on that, but they do exist. Mm -hmm. down in the Someone else that knows Chinese that has a background in the language can, can say for certain. I see Janet Liu posted in the chat um, that you do get crossword puzzles and Chinese characters. Um, and so those oh, okay. would have the tone. Instead of pinyin, okay. Yeah, and that would make it even that much more difficult, right? <laughs> Construct. I, I'm pretty sure that at least for Japanese puzzles, you know, which the writing systems used in Japanese puzzles will be ones that have one symbol for a syllable. Um, usually those will be smaller than American puzzles. So instead of 15 by 15, it might be, you know, nine by nine or something, which makes sense just because, um, you know, it's going to be very hard to find a 15 syllable word that could go across the entire puzzle, for example. Actually, uh, she sent uh, an image, which I will share on the screen here. Um, Oh, I, it's a new computer, I so I have to allow it to share on the screen. Okay, uh, but you can you can access that in the chat. Uh. Yeah, and uh, Andrea left a comment about this, which yeah is something that crossword solvers will sometimes complain about, um, which is you'll often have a situation where, um, you know, for example, one common crossword answer is the French word for summer. 
which is, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but it's spelled E-T-E, -E, but in French, both of the E's have accent marks on them. Yet usually those E's will be crossing some standard English word, which does not have the accent marks. So, um, you know, some people don't think you should be allowed to do that because it could be thought of as two different characters. And the specific one Andrea mentioned was the Spanish word año, which means year, often shows up in crosswords. And the thing is that the word año for year normally is a tilde on the N, um, but um, without the tilde, it's a less pleasant word. So uh, people sometimes <laughs> get mad about including that because it is ambiguous in the crossword grid. Okay, and here's the Chinese crossword puzzle for you, Sophia. <laughs> And you can grab that from the chat. <laughs> so it looks like the um, the Chinese crossword puzzle. What they're using are free common phrases or literary phrases, rather than because the characters themselves are uh, complete phonemes. So in the and if you know Chinese, you will know what the tone is. It's part of learning the the language and learning the, uh, you know, to read it and so on. So, you know, when they write the characters, they never write the, there's never a tone mark. Um, and when they write in pinyin, there's also not usually tone marks, you know, um, you're just expected to know it, you know, <laughs> or have learned it, you know, so, yeah. So it looks like, I mean, from the example that she gave, now I'm not an expert on Chinese crossword puzzles. It's not something that I, did, but there are like three and four character expressions. So these are um, ubiquitous in Chinese writing, especially uh, of more formal nature. Um, and they're often based on classical Chinese. So to be able to do it, you know, you would have to have a pretty strong familiarity with classical Chinese um, as well. So that makes complete sense to me that um, they would have a clue that relates to, say, the meaning of the expression. So it's probably more meaning oriented than sound oriented. I don't know if, uh, if anybody else wants to comment on that. Uh, Janet, did, did, is Janet still on with us? Uh, would you like to uh, share perhaps a website where Sophia could access uh, Chinese? Let's see. I, I don't see her now. I just got this um, like example, from, like um, by just googling. But I guess there are different versions of crosswords you can have in Chinese. I, I think that's one kind of typical way where you can just practice your um, um, vocabulary in um, which refers to, to in Mandarin Chinese would be uh, cheng yu. Like if like it's like four words expression which are kind of like commonly used, uh, and you are gonna just learn that in your um, um, elementary education or like uh, middle school education, which are kind of like literal or uh, classical. So I guess that's just one way of doing a uh, crossword in Mandarin Chinese, but I guess there are probably other ways like the one that similar to the English one. Oh, thank you. And Matt had a couple questions. Matt, would you like to ask your questions? Thanks. Uh, first, I was wondering, since you mentioned crosswords uh, in non-English languages, if um, like, how did, did you do any research on how crosswords work for inflectional languages? Since uh, the endings like are, are, are a lot more repetitive in those languages than they are in English. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right. So yeah, so I've not done research on this, just to speculate, you could imagine that some of those languages would allow you to just um, only write the stems in the grid instead of the inflections, because you, yeah, you could imagine, to imagine really extreme scenarios, say, um, maybe you have a language where every word needs either the ending um, OS or AS on it, say, and that would mean that every single word in the language ends with the letter S, which means um, whichever entry is going along the side of the grid will have to be just all S's, which wouldn't work. So for that language, you would need to be able to leave off the stems. But I don't know if languages actually do that. Um, just speculating. 
Okay, thank you. And then my, my other question was, since you were talking about Oreo as in mountain earlier, I was wondering, is it still a, still a common practice for crosswords to have answers that are just bound morphemes um, and then not like uh, words that have meaning if you um, separate it from the word? Yes, yeah. So they will still often include prefixes or suffixes. So you'll see, for example, IST is a pretty common answer clued as um, suffix for a follower of an ideology. Um, so for example, you know, uh, Marxist, that you have that suffix est. Um, so you still will see those, but now they try to stick to prefixes and suffixes that, you know, most speakers of language will know, unlike Oreo. And uh, Connie Ramsey, your teacher, wants to say hello. Hi, Mr. Ramsey. Yeah, I see your comment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, um, so she's the one who taught me um, in her class was where we were translating the Aeneid, and that's where I learned about this line about um, Dido and Aeneas being in the same cave, and clearly that really stuck with me. <laughs> and Dragomir has a comment about French, Spanish, French, and Italian. Uh, he says it, it's very common to use inflected forms. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I guess I mentioned how having the inflection could make it harder, but there are ways it can make it easier. So, for example, in English, the fact that any noun pretty much can be pluralized just by adding S gives you a lot of flexibility where if there's a word that would fit, but it's one letter too short, you just stick the S on and now it does fit. So if you have a language with a lot of morphology um, and a lot of possible endings that could go on a word, um, okay, I see Aleka is saying in Greek as well, that um, you know, that can actually make you know, the constructing task easier. All right. Uh, oh, Chris Ruffalo said it was uh, nice to see all the North Allegheny alumni here. Yeah, she's so, another. Who, <laughs> and what is North Allegheny? Uh, oh, that was my high school school district. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. He's going to cast his ballot. He's a, or she. She's going to cast her ballot. All right. Um, Dragomir, do you want to ask your question about Bulgarian or make a comment on Bulgarian? Yeah, it's not a comment. It's just I'm saying I, I do puzzles in Bulgarian, and in Bulgarian, it's the structure of the puzzle is very different. So verbs and adjectives, for example, are not allowed at all. Uh, maybe only as exceptions. Uh, especially things like plurals of nouns are not allowed, but you have a lot of geographical entities, mm -hmm. and especially things that nobody would know, like a river in Vietnam with three letters. Oh. <laughs> All right. So I make them tough in, in Bulgarian. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning a lot just from this question period. It's really great. <laughs> yeah. And are there any questions I missed? Anybody who wants to just pipe up and ask your question or make a comment? Sadita? Sajida? Sajida? Um, just all this talk about different languages has got me thinking, and I'm thinking of languages like um, Arabic and Persian and, and Urdu, where the languages, the letters are actually joined together. So you just could not write them without splitting them up into separate letters, which is almost illegible for people who um, read the language. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to know. I might Google that later at the end of this call to see if if they do exist in those languages at all. Yeah, I agree that. <laughs> and uh, Sora, uh, Sora, says uh, they haven't seen any puzzles in Hindi, <laughs> but you'd like to see them. Is that right, Sura? Yeah, because uh, most of the puzzles here are in English, maybe because the Hindi newspapers as well are not that common. But yeah, everything, that, all the crosswords that I do at least are all in English and mostly follow the British format, so maybe. And the thing that Sajida said about uh, letters morphing into each other, that's a problem in Hindi as well. So yeah, m maybe that's a problem. That's why it's, that doesn't really happen much in this language. Mm. 
I know in, uh, I, I'm studying Dari right now and it, the letters, uh, the words are written one way and pronounced another way. <laughs> I, and I think, uh, I think sometimes in, in crosswords there, there are words written out in the way that they're pronounced too, right? The, rather than the way they're, they're usually written. So interesting variations. Uh, let's see, uh, Andrea, you re recommend somebody as one of the most prolific constructors in non-English crosswords. Um, would you like to tell us about that? Andrea? Oh, oh hi. Um, no, I just meant that um, Joaquin is from China and I don't think she learned English until she was in her thirties or something. And she's written hundreds of puzzles in English and is, you know, super prolific. I just thought she, maybe someone, um, Sophia could contact to find out what the deal was with crossword puzzles um, back in, in China. That's all. Yeah, she's an incredibly, um, she's one of my favorite construction constructors and it's especially impressive that she makes so many great puzzles, given that English is not her native language, because it's hard enough to think of all this wordplay when you're a native mm -hmm. speaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know where she's located? Yeah, she she's lives in Minneapolis, um, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's and so she she looks at obviously she looks at words in a totally different way in English, and so she can make all sorts of fun connections that would never occur to us. You know, it's sort of like Nabokov and is five languages or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I guess we're just, well, we're at four o'clock now. We said we'd, we'd go to four. Uh, anybody have any, any final comments or, or questions before we sign off? Just let me say again, um, uh, thank you, Tom, for, uh, for your talk. And uh, I think uh, based on the, the comments we've been getting, it's a huge success and A plus. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you both uh, Greg and Jill for organizing this. I really had a blast. <laughs>